Good morning, church. Welcome to worship on this third Sunday in Pentecost. Uh, I am Pastor Julie Grief, and it is my privilege to be pastor here and be back with you all. I am so glad that you have joined us for worship today. Last night, the church was rocking. We had um, the youth group that came from um, POP, uh, Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in uh, La Crescent, Minnesota. They came through on the end of their mission trip. They were coming from, um, uh, oh, I'm blanking, Port, Port Heron, Port Heron, is that correct? Port Heron, uh, Michigan, where they had joined other, um, other youth groups. I believe it's like 69 youth groups. And they became 47 teams that helped either paint or reconstruct um, uh, individuals' houses. So they built wheelchair ramps for a person who had, um, uh, you know, is in a, is an electric wheelchair. The stories were incredible. The kids were mixed up amongst all these groups. Uh, they were out being the hands and feet of Christ, living out that mission, and we too became part of that mission, opening our doors, feeding them with some tasty foods that they were so excited to have. For them to find a basketball court was beyond their wildest dreams. Basketballs were going, volleyballs were going, and in fact, volleyballs were going outside in the parking lot in which neighbor children joined in. And they were all just, they got up to 50 I hits, I believe. And also, for my own joy that I didn't know would happen, they broke out into a dance, and I think it's called church dance. Is that right, Ben? I found out. It's church dance. There's a whole church dance. So with, what? Oh, sorry. See? Church clap. I'm going to get to learn that today. So maybe one day we'll all learn how to do church clap. But just, I'm sharing a long announcement, but the video is on our Facebook page. I did post it there. I'll also send it out um, in the link um, on Friday so people can watch it. If you don't see the joy, we're going to need to talk because it was fantastic. Um, so I share my enthusiasm, but I also share my thank you. I thank you to all of you who helped make this happen and continue to live out the gospel and the mission in this world. A couple now brief um, uh, reminders. Him Madness is still going on. I saw on Jane's desk, there's lots have been turned in. If you haven't gotten a chance to turn in your favorite hymns or perhaps you didn't get one that you hear today, feel free to add along the way. We are still uh, collecting the submissions for that. I also wanted to address or a reminder of COVID levels. Um, our COVID levels, as we all know, are up and down. And so as a leadership team here at the church, we've tried to kind of find a way on uh, my return. The, I believe on Friday, the COVID levels here went to low. Know that um, masks are encouraged, um, but they are optional, and particularly when times are low. The most important thing is that we respect our neighbors and the choices that, that people are making and that we care for our neighbors as well as caring for our own health. And then next Sunday, what happens? Anyone? Outside, yay! Okay, I just want a reminder. Next Sunday, we get to join our neighbors. Our um, New England uh, church, we will be joining for worship at what time? 10 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. It might throw off some of your eating, but at the end of our worship service across the street outdoors, we will join in for some strawberry shortcake. So get to sleep in a little bit, get a little strawberry shortcake, and get some wonderful time together. What more could be glorious on a Sunday? So I hope you will join us. Um, you are encouraged if you are able to bring a chair over to the service. There will be chairs, but if anyone knows that they need one, let me know. Um, and we will look forward to seeing everyone next Sunday. And with that, for those who are uh, watching online, the service will not be recorded. So please note that the service will not be recorded next Sunday since it's outlined and our internets only go so far. And with that, those are the announcements for today. Let us take a, a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
please stand as you are comfortable. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. The fullness of God's love and breath, of God's and great grace, be with you all.
Sovereign, let us pray. Sovereign God, ruler of all hearts, you call us to obey you and to favor us with true freedom. Keep us faithful in the ways of your Son, that leaving behind all that hinders us, we may steadfastly follow your paths through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from 1 Kings. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel, Mehola, as prophet in your place. So he set out from there and found Elijah, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were 12 yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. Word of God, word of life. A reading from Galatians. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also be guided by the Spirit. Word of God, word of life. Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. 
On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you will you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand on the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, friends, it is good to be back with you all. We truly were blessed to be able to finally take our postponed 2020 trip to Italy. And believe it or not, I began planning for that trip in 2016. I have so many stories of our trip, and there were so many experiences that I still really am still processing them and grateful for all those photographs that trigger the memories. But as we returned uh, this week and we rode that elevator down, or the escalator down into the U.S. Customs at O'Hare, I kid you not, there were at a minimum a thousand or more people in line ahead of us. The line snaked back and forth. It was already filled. We were going to the edges. There were lines of wheelchairs just waiting. And they had people pushing them, and they had two or if I might, maybe even three lines just designated for the wheelchairs to go through. Clearly, travel is back on. People are journeying to their destinations. And in this trip, I was reminded that in order to get to your destination, you have to go through security, you've got to deal with the ticket counter, you got to deal with other passengers, and oh yes, delays. But it's those steps, it's those people and those experiences within the journey that's where all the stories come from. That's where all the events happen. It's not really going from point A to point B. It's the in-between, how you got there. And, of course, me thinking about Jesus, it's not just, hey, there was a man, Jesus, who left Galilee and arrived in Jerusalem. It's all those encounters with people and events that happen those stories that are recorded throughout the Gospels, that's where Jesus' teachings come from. And over these next months and months during this ordinary time and on, we'll be focused, our itinerary is focused on what genuine discipleship looks like, what it feels like. We'll hear stories of Jesus' journey throughout what is called Luke's travel narrative. Do you know that's 10 full chapters of Luke's gospel. We'll walk alongside him, listening and learning and from Jesus as we make our way to the holy city. Now, as I prepared for my trip to Italy, knowing I had a long journey ahead, airplanes, boats, automobiles, I pulled together and downloaded all those readings and podcasts that I kept meeting to get to. And as our journey began, 
as we readied ourselves in our seats for takeoff, sights set for Italy, we ultimately faced a two-hour delay, just sitting on the ground, waiting for a logbook to arrive so we could show up, so we could take off. So in an effort to distract myself from that building frustration and disappointment, I turned to my pile and I watched a TED talk um, that was done a few years ago by Jay Jang, where he talked about his experience of rejection. He openly shared about the pain and the fear of rejection that had deeply affected his life. So he did an experiment he called rejection therapy. For a hundred days straight, he sought out opportunities to be rejected. So I watched several of his videos. In fact, Luther joined in on this from his blog. And he has some ridiculous requests, like asking a complete stranger on the street if he could borrow $100. In one video, he ate a burger at a fast food restaurant and then went to the counter and asked for a burger refill. That did get him rejected. He was even rejected a few times trying to give $5 bills just to random people. Jay's goal was to get used to people telling him no so that that rejection would no longer bother him. In today's gospel, Jesus and the disciples get rejected. They entered the Samaritan village and Luke tells us that the people of the village, they did not receive him. And honestly, I don't know what that means. Because remember, the Samaritans and the Jewish people also often didn't get along. So maybe it was just that nobody wanted to talk. Maybe Jesus asked for a meal or a place to stay and no one would help him. And whatever it was, these people were certainly not ready for Jesus' message. So two of the disciples, James and John, they see what happens. And they do not react well to rejection. In fact, they seem pretty ticked off at this village. And I just love, and maybe you do too or not, but how casual their question to Jesus sounds. Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Wait, what? I will say that calling down fire seems a bit of an overreaction. And fortunately, burning down the village and all the people in it is too extreme for Jesus too. And he rebukes them and they go on to another village. Now, as much as they are overreacting though, I can understand James and John's frustration. They know the good Jesus is doing. They know how important his mission is. They've caught a vision of God's kingdom. And so it doesn't make sense when others don't understand when this village rejects him. And yet, don't we too do that? We get upset with people who reject our message. When the people around us don't care about our care about what we ourselves care about. Hopefully, you don't want to literally burn those people up. But like all of us, don't you get frustrated? I do. It hurts. And I get it. I want people to share my passions. It's hard when other people don't make giving and participating in the life of the church as high of a priority as I do. It hurts when planning an activity and an event and people don't think it's worth showing up to. It's hard when I go somewhere on a Sunday afternoon or if I open up Facebook and I, I see people who didn't come to worship. And even when those reasons are legitimate to be fully transparent and honest, it's still a bit painful because rejection always hurts 
but especially when it's over something as personal as faith. It's hard when you raise your kids to go to church every week and they drift away. Sometimes when your family's friends or neighbors don't come to church, it feels like they're saying your faith, it doesn't matter. So maybe James and John's knee-jerk reaction is understandable. Remember, they've given up everything to follow Jesus. This matters to them, just like it matters to you and to me. Of course, even though their reaction is understandable, it's not right. And Jesus reprimands them for it. James and John are so wrapped up in how insulted and offended they are so they, and it's how it just directly affects them. It doesn't occur to them to care about the people in the village, the people that they're offering to know, the people that they want to incinerate. They're so stuck in the inconvenience that has been caused to them that they commit the sin of failing to see their neighbors, the Samaritans, as children of God. And that is a constant temptation for us too, isn't it? How it easy it is for us to see others and only how they affect us, rather seeing them as people made in God's image. So often, the narrative in our country and in the media encourages us to focus on what we have to lose, what we have at stake. So I suspect that Jesus' rebuke may be also to us to be a little less self-centered, to be a bit more willing to give to others, to give the benefit of the doubt that we ourselves might want and maybe a little less willing to call down fire from heaven, and a lot more willing to accept rejection and the loss for Jesus' sake and for the sake of our neighbors. It's what Paul says to the Galatians. The whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So now as they're on the road and they're continuing the journey, someone comes up to Jesus and says, I will follow you wherever you go. That's good, right? This guy is doing what all of us should be doing as disciples. But then Jesus reads him the fine print, giving them a glimpse of what being a disciple might really look like. Being a disciple and following Jesus will mean sacrifice and hardship. It means change. It means letting go of the past. It'll involve being rejected. So as they continue on, Jesus calls to someone else and says, follow me. And the one replies, yes, I'll follow. I want to be a disciple. But first... Let me go and bury my father. Another one says, but first, let me say goodbye to my family. Again, to be honest, I struggle with this part of the story because they seem like reasonable excuses. I mean, they are not rejecting Jesus' invitation. They're not saying they won't follow They just need to take care of some stuff first. They have responsibilities, just like us. But Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to the cross, on his way to give his life for the world, and they need to be ready to follow now, here, right away, in this time and in this place. Yet there is so much wrapped up in but first. By definition, being a disciple means following Jesus. 
It means recognizing that life is not all about us, but about Jesus. It means putting Jesus and those Jesus commands us to love before ourselves. And it also means being rejected by the world and being and rejecting parts of the world that distract us from following Jesus. Jay Jang shared in his TED Talk, he says, in my research, I found that people who really change the world, who change the way we live and the way we think, are the people who were met with initial and often violent rejections. People like Martin Luther King, like Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, and even Jesus Christ. These people did not let rejection define them, he says. They let their own reaction after the rejection define themselves. And they embraced rejection. Being a disciple certainly is not easy, right? It's all good and well to be asked to follow Jesus but once we find out what it entails, it becomes a different matter altogether for many to hear the call. Because, you know, we're really good at finding excuses when Jesus calls us to those hard things. Well, at least I am. Yes, Jesus, I would love to give 10% of my income to you this week. But first, let me pay my phone bill. But first, I like my Starbucks. I like a burger to eat. Yes, Lord, I really plan to go to church this week. But first, let me go get some groceries. But first, let me clean the house. Yes, Jesus, I'd love to advocate for your children in need, your children in prison, your children immigrating and crossing borders. But first, I need to make sure no one will be offended. You know, even these amazing youth who spent the night last night, the ones who followed Jesus and went on a mission trip, yep, those kids, as they shared their stories with me, they too had their but first. But first, in order to go on this trip, I have to figure out what my work schedule looks like. I needed to check with my coach to see if I could miss practices for a week. But first, I need to figure out who else is going to go. But first, I need to figure out who will love my dog when I'm gone. She will be lonely. What about you? What are your but firsts? I wonder... What are the things you do to put in front to following Jesus? Dear church, God is waiting for us, pulling us to God's self. If only we can find the courage to step forward in this journey, step into the future, and let God do as God does, creating and making all things new including us. Amen.
together as the church, we join our voices in one body, confessing our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, creation, and all in need. God of faithfulness, set the face of your church firmly on you, rooted in your self-giving love. May the church find freedom in loving our neighbors. God of grace, God of gentleness, strengthen the earth's ability to heal. Where there are dangerous storms, bring calm. Where there are destructive fires, bring rain. Protect homes, habitats, and livelihoods threatened by climate disasters. God of grace, God of peace, guide all who govern that they place the good of their citizens above self-promotion. Anoint leaders of nations with your spirit of neighborly love. Protect refugees and all who live under tyranny or conflict, especially those in Ukraine. God of grace. God of kindness, reveal your healing presence to all who are sick or dying, especially those we name aloud or silently in our hearts. Uphold those who grieve. Support the needs of any who are unemployed, hungry, or have nowhere to lay their heads. God of grace. God of love. Attend to those struggling with addiction, depression, or uncontrolled anger. Provide support systems and loving companions as they work toward health, that they may rest in hope and know the fullness of joy in your presence. God of grace, God of joy, we give thanks for all who have died and now celebrate the inheritance of life in you. Keep their examples of faithfulness always before us, that we trust your promises in life and in death. God of grace, God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit. We entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share a sign of God's peace. You may be seated.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field, and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus. In preparation for Holy Communion, I invite you to locate those pre-packaged communion kits that you picked up on your way in. If you're in need of a communion kit, just raise your hand and we'll have a worship host bring one to you. At the end of the great Thanksgiving, we will commune together uh, from your remaining in your seats, and I'll give instructions for that. You're also invited to hold up those communion kits um, during the words of institution. And for anyone who is not receiving a Holy Communion at this time, a blessing may be given and shared, making a sign of the cross on their forehead or hand and saying, God loves you today and every day, no matter what. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, you reveal your glory as the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, equal in majesty, undivided in splendor, one Lord, one God, ever to be adored in your eternal glory. And so with all the choirs of angels and with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O God, creator of heaven and earth. You rescued your covenant people, led them all on their journeys, and taught them by the prophets. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this meal and make us one in this community of faith and with your people throughout the world. Glory and praise to you, O God, author of life, word made flesh, power of the Most High, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those not 
In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet. You may be seated. Here at Our Savior, all are welcome to the Lord's table. At this time, you may take out your communi communion kits, and we will commune together. First, peel back that top layer to uncover the bread. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. You may turn that over and peel back the second layer of foil to uncover the wine or juice, the blood of Christ shed for you. Please stand as you're comfortable. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Dear church, we remember that God is the giver of life. Every day we give thanks for God and for our lives. We give thanks for pastors who go off script for a moment. We give thanks also for the life and the life and the faithful life of our friend Dick Miller, who I believe has a birthday today. Number 96. And I'm just hopeful that as we know, we have such a fabulous music director and organist, he might be able to help us in a little rendition of happy birthday before we leave this place. Dear Dick, let us sing for you. Happy birthday. Dear church, live in hope, love with mercy, leave no stone unturned in your calling as one of God's precious disciples. For as often as you heed the word of the Lord, you turn toward what is good and beautiful. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shine upon you with grace and mercy the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Go in peace. Love your neighbor.